thank you everybody for being on our webinar today. I love collaborating with Lisa, albeit this is a different format than we typically do, um, but we hope to make it interactive. I think both Lisa and I, as if many of you might know us, that we both can talk for days, um, but we're hopefully gonna get through the content and leave some time at the end for questions. I thought I would start off for those of you on the phone um, who don't know me with just a quick introduction and then have Lisa do the same and then we'll get right into the presentation. So my name is Arden O'Connor. I run a concierge behavioral health group called O'Connor Professional Group. We work with clients all over the country on a range of areas from addiction and mental health to eating disorders and autism. We work with young children through much older adults, providing a variety of in-home consultative and intervention type services. And we're really honored to have Lisa as a partner on those very difficult cases where families are trying to navigate a situation with somebody who might not have insight into their issue and might really require somebody to come in and provide support and look at legal intervention strategies. So Lisa, do you want to introduce yourself to the group? Thank you, and it's delightful to speak with you again. Different venue to do it by webinar, but it, it's you and I doing it again, which is great. So my practice is a law practice, uh, and it's a concierge practice, and this is why you and I are able to partner so well. You know, I, I have a team, and we're able to uh, pull together a group of people to find legal and clinical multidisciplinary strategies to solve some of life's really difficult issues. So I handle guardianship and conservatorship, trust planning, trust litigation, estate litigation, divorce. I'm very often asked to protect families and protect the family structure to look after children, whether they're minors or whether they're now adults, whether there are special needs in the families, Families are, are, there are so many forces that press on the family and mental health issues and addiction issues are just two of those that are high level. So I not only handle the work as a litigator and as the person who will bring you through court comfortably and successfully to the extent possible, but I also serve as guardian, conservator, trustee. And during the COVID shelter, I have made sure that people have food at their door. I had a Passover Seder delivered to one of my clients' doors. Uh, and Arden and I can work together, no matter whether there is a pandemic or not, we are in touch frequently. And we can bring all kinds of services because the two of us understand what it means to roll up our sleeves and provide a high touch, elegant concierge level of support, both clinical and legal. And we can really create a wraparound situation where your family members' needs are met in every way. Wonderful. Well, thank you. And again, I'm honored to be presenting with you, Lisa. We're gonna dig right into the presentation. Um, here's a little bit about our bios, and we kind of talked to those, but you'll have them in the presentation. So we're gonna talk about COVID-19 and behavioral health. And I thought we would cover it from two general categories. So obviously this is a new phenomenon. We have, most of us I think on the phone today or on the computer haven't necessarily been through a pandemic before. Um, but if we look at prevalence rates, it, you know, some of the stats that we were able to pull suggest that 45% of adults are saying that the coronavirus pandemic is, is harming their mental health. Um, and I think if we think about that broadly, in general, if we were in normal circumstances, and I use quotes because who knows what the new normal will be or whether we will go back to a new normal, um, they, I would say about 25% of the population typically is deemed having a mental health issue. So 45% is a lot higher. I think the other thing that's interesting for, for attorneys and for other financial advisors on the phone to think about is sort of what their employees are going through. There was an interesting article on the 1st of May put out by Harvard Business School Review, and that suggested that even higher statistics, closer to 50 to 60% of employees were either experiencing depression or anxiety. And it's due to some of the reasons that are right here on the slide. You know, folks feeling socially isolated. The article actually mentioned 
that most employees missed the water cooler moments where they actually got to interact with folks in person in a much more um, fluid way than is, is able that they're able to do now via Zoom or other more structured contexts. Um, I think a lot of people are feeling uncertainty around the economics of where the country is going to be. Lots of folks are worried about their own health, their own family's health, older family members' health. And I do want to say one quick word around, I think, what has exacerbated some of these mental health issues are, are issues of racial inequality that we're seeing in the news and people experiencing trauma related to those and concerns about their safety and well-being. So Americans are worried, you know, they're worried that their investments will be impacted. 59% impact, they're worried about their investments being impacted for a long time. 53% worry about family members get sick. You know, I think one of the interesting anecdotes that we have seen as we have been, as the coronavirus has progressed, is an issue with families that are concerned about not only about the illness rates, about the economic uncertainties, but what is the fall going to hold? You know, are we ever, I think there was some hope in the spring that this may last a certain amount of time. We're now seeing family members where camps have been canceled. We're concerned about little children and their ability to socially interact. We're worried about long-term developmental impact amongst children and adults around this pandemic. So signs and symptoms of anxiety. And I, I'd like to point out something here. So when we talk about anxiety, there are two types. I'm not a clinician, so I will own that. And those of you on the phone will definitely know that I'm not a clinician because this is a rather simplistic view. But I think about anxiety in two ways. So there's generalized anxiety disorder, which is people who experience any one or multiple of these symptoms that are listed on the slide in life. There's no event you can point to that's causing it. There's not necessarily a traumatic incident. It's just their general state of being. Um, and many of us, I think, high achieving folks have some degree of anxiety. I think one of the tricky things we've seen as a firm around anxiety is it also often can be something that encourages people to perform well. It gets them excited as a webinar starts. I know for me, you get a little bit of those you know, tingles in your stomach. Am I going to do okay on that? And that can be very motivating. I think for some folks, um, anxiety can be debilitating. It can, it can lead to physical symptoms that are quite severe. You know, you, it, it definitely is portrayed in the media and on TV shows where you see people actually experiencing full-on panic attacks. We can see emotional symptoms where people are really ruminating on troubling thoughts. We've had clients who have such debilitating anxiety, they can't make a decision. They're like a deer in headlights. You can't make a decision one way or the other. And that's sort of a good description from, from my perspective on generalized anxiety disorder. What's interesting about COVID-19 is I think there's a lot of us who fall into that situational anxiety disorder that had COVID not happened, maybe we had low levels of anxiety, but nothing that would be clinically significant. All of a sudden now, you know, situational anxiety pops up for all the reasons that I talked about. Economic uncertainty, health uncertainty, uncertainty of your business, um, and so we're seeing a much broader percentage of the population being impacted. I would say for those cases where attorneys are interacting or other types of advisors with clients, there are a few tips that we can have as general non-clinical professionals. And we'll get into some of the more, the depths of what can be done clinically for anxiety in a minute. But I was trying to think of like, what are tips for folks who are interacting with clients? When COVID first started, we work a lot with financial advisors in addition to attorneys. And one of the advisors mentioned that she had multiple clients who were ready to take all their money out of the market. They were gonna put it somewhere else. They were gonna hide it under their mattress. They were literally, I had multiple financial advisors saying they were literally you know, walking clients off a proverbial ledge on a daily basis. So I started to pull some of them and look into sort of what are, techniques that attorneys can use to help quell the, and make the waters a little calmer. So one is around proactive email and phone communication. The um, Harvard Business School review article that I mentioned polled employees, uh, 2,700 employees, and they mentioned that 90% said they would feel better if their employers would communicate daily, um, I'm sorry, weekly, 40% wanted I'm sorry, I'm going to get these statistics all mixed up. 90% said they wanted at least weekly communication from their employers. 29% said they wanted daily communication from their employers. Now, I recognize 
that's not always feasible to do. And as the virus has lingered, you know, we as employers, we can't always predict the future and provide useful information on a daily basis. But it does, I think, indicate the importance of people feeling like we're being transparent, we're reaching out. Some of the best practices I've seen with companies, and this applies to attorneys with clients as well, is to proactively reach out and say, I'm here to support you. How are you doing? And with a special eye, I would say, to those folks who have perhaps an older family member in an assisted living where we know the statistics of COVID are higher, who are folks who are negatively impacted in their businesses, people liking that like personal touch and feeling like it wasn't just a blanket message. Uh, I think the blanket messages are important and necessary. We included one example on this slide from a financial firm. But I think the other piece is really to have tailored personal communication. I think we've seen also attorneys reminding clients that there are precedents, maybe not for this particular pandemic, but for other issues that have impacted the stock market in a negative way. I think one distinction I would say for attorneys, unlike financial advisors, is that in some ways COVID-19 has provided an opportunity to use crisis as a time to do some long-term planning. I know for one, I really resisted writing an estate plan. It felt like I had to get all this information and I had to think about things and who wants to think about death? And really when this happened, you know, all of a sudden, many of us, I think, stepped back and said, do we have our affairs in order? God forbid this hits. The last thing you want to be doing is scrambling on a hospital bed, trying to get your ducks in a row. So listening and remaining a trusted advisor is great. I would say one other piece is attorneys can also see if it's an opportunity for clients to do some of the planning while they're cooped up in the house um, that they'd always said they were going to do. The last area that I think attorneys, if they're a trusted advisor to clients, can be helpful, and this can apply even within their own families, is to remind people that it's okay to be a good enough parent. Um, and I bring this up because a lot of the conversations we're having with our clients surround around summer. And many families are saying, you know, geez, the home in Nantucket I had rented, oy, we're not going to be able to go this year, and my kids aren't going to be able to go to the camp they wanted to. And I love this quote by Susan Goldberg. I'll just say it. I'm not here to make my children's lives magical. I'm here to feed, clothe, and love them. And I'm also here to provide them with some opportunities for learning, growth, and fun. I'm also here to support them, part of which involves stepping back and letting them try and sometimes fail, but hopefully try again on their own. But magic, magic is not in the job description. And I say this with a lighthearted, as a lighthearted way to remind all of us on the phone that this may be a summer of learning, of growth for children. It may not be the summer you had envisioned, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to become supreme party planners uh, overnight and try and figure out how to structure every part of the day in an optimal way. It may be the summer where you and your partner or, or you and you have to kind of set expectations appropriately with kids and get them involved in what time you know, is the, a reasonable curfew? How much screen time is available? What activities could you do on your own so that mommy or daddy or whomever in the household has some opportunities to balance work? So when is the line, and this is when I would say for most people who are non-clinical professionals, it might be an opportune time to contact either our firm or another trusted therapist or psychiatrist. But when does the line go from being situational anxiety or anxiety that's explained by one particular incident into an area that's more severe? I think we look at a few components at O'Connor Professional Group. You know, is the behaviors that the client are exhibiting impacting their life in very fundamental ways? Is it impacting their sleep? I don't mean one night of restless sleep. I mean weeks and weeks of inability to sleep of regular seven to eight hours or whatever your body needs. Is it impacting their job? Are they no longer finding pleasure in some of the activities that brought them joy? Have they tried other interventions? We'll talk a little bit in a minute about common interventions. I'm sure many of you know the benefits of meditation, of exercise, of eating well, and the impact that has on anxiety. Many people who exhibit extreme impact from anxiety have already tried some of those daily life activities and they're still not getting to a place where they can feel calm and measured and in control of their emotions. Um, we certainly see folks who use poor coping strategies. So overindulging in alcohol um, is, a, is a prime example as one. And I think 
you know, I read a statistic in March that online alcohol sales during COVID were up 300%. Um, so it gives you a sense, and hopefully those are folks, many of whom are imbibing responsibly, um, but, but I think for some folks, it's a real way to cope with anxiety and stress over loss of income, challenges in the home. I, we also know a lot of families that haven't spent this much concentrated time with their family members, and it's bringing up behaviors. They're seeing the reality of a loved one's behaviors in a different way. It's bringing up stressors within a marriage or within a child um, and parent dynamic. Um, and I would also say we look at the time frame. So if somebody has had symptoms for longer than two to three weeks that seem to continue and not be getting better, it's a time to suggest a, a clinical resource. So general ways to address depression and anxiety, um, and we'll get into some of the outpatient and inpatient resources, but if we think about the way families look at it, it's we've seen people write down and journal their feelings. We've seen a lot of folks use Insight Timer, for those of you who know that app. It provides guided and non-guided meditations at certain intervals on certain topics. I would say during this time, probably the biggest piece of advice, in fact, I think I should have a t-shirt that says, there's no reason to have CNN on all day long. Um, it, I think the exposure to news, um, one of the best webinars I attended early in the COVID pandemic suggested that if you can in the morning, which this is very hard and I don't practice what I preach every day, if you can get up in the morning and start your day with meditation, physical activity, something that gives your body an ability to reset and have some clarity before you expose yourself to news and Facebook and all the various emails, you will start your day in a much more centered way. And I have to say the days I actually follow that prescription I do much better. And I do think also those folks who are reading news minute to minute, TV on in the background, not only are you getting exposed to very traumatic incidents that often make us feel helpless, but those in your household are. So small children who may not understand everything, or even older children who need to have a time, a concentrated time to process things with parents, as opposed to just tons of information being flooded in. Um, certainly looking at negative behaviors and maintaining a schedule for many families. Um, I remember talking to one dad who mentioned that in his household, I was talking about all these various systems to manage children during this time. I said, you could use checklists, the kids could devise the, the list. And he sort of smiled at me and said, you don't have children. I said, you're correct. He said, I have four. We do it my way. We get up, we do push-ups, we run around the block a few times, we do our chores, we have our breakfast. And then we have a schedule and we give some time in the afternoon for more downtime, but we maintain a schedule. So on the clinical care side, and, and these are general options that exist, but I'll speak to them as they apply to COVID. I, you know, I think a lot of families who have had a loved one and certainly your clients, if they have somebody struggling with a major depressive incident, a psychotic issue, um, mental, other mental health issues, borderline personality disorders, eating disorders, addiction, you know, residential programs are open. So that's the third bucket down. Um, each of them has different policies and procedures related to how they manage COVID risk, what they do to test and keep people safe. We are seeing an increase, and I'm sure many of you know this already, in the amount of telehealth that's available. We're seeing unprecedented regulation lifts where people are allowed to do telehealth with licensed clinicians in one state with a patient in another. Um, we're seeing a lot of outpatient care that even now during the summer is still being offered online. I will say my own personal opinion is this is a really hard time for somebody who's in early stage clinical stabilization or addiction recovery. For those folks who haven't had a structured experience in a residential program, who have had maybe a, a short stay in a detox or a short stabilization stay in a hospital, having most of their care being offered online can be very difficult because it presumes a certain level of motivation to actually open the computer, connect on Zoom. We're seeing many patients who choose to engage and not engage or sometimes even intoxicated when they're engaged. So it's a better solution than nothing. I'm thrilled it's there. But I would say for those very early vulnerable patients who are not highly motivated for their care, it's a, it's a tricky time. And that brings us to the last one you know, where our company is perfectly situated. We do a lot of in-home work. Our, our employees are still going out have been during COVID trying to do it as safely as possible, but seeing clients in their homes. Because for so many of these folks, the social isolation that's brought about by COVID 
has increased their symptoms and has made it even more difficult to get the kind of care they need to get stabilized. Last thing I'll talk about before handing it over to Lisa, who has some great things to say, um, is around man clinical tools to manage resistance. You know, I, I joked when I started OPG, people always ask me, well, clients must love the services, and I say family members do. And they say, well, clients must, and I try to go back with the same, well, family members do. I've been waiting for the client at OPG who comes running arms open to say, we're so excited you're here. Please come into my home and tell me how, I, how you can help me. Sometimes we get that, but more often than not, we're dealing with people who would be described as having low insight, meaning they don't necessarily think they have a substance use issue. They don't necessarily recognize that they're bipolar. They don't necessarily think we or anybody in the clinical realm is needed. Um, and I think it's a really important issue because it's where families and your clients will get stuck the most. They hear messaging in some self-help groups. I'm a big proponent of AA, but I think in some of the Al-Anon meetings, families hear, well, they have to hit rock bottom. And so families assume their only choice is to cut somebody off completely emotionally and financially to get an outcome. And they're not willing to do that, so they do nothing. Um, and I think there's a lot of other solutions that can provide family with some leverage, help families to get to manage someone with resistance and get to a better outcome. And certainly, at least is going to talk about the legal side. On the clinical side, we find giving people a voice in their care. We deal with a lot of late stage alcoholics who say, I'm not going into a treatment center. I'm working. I can't afford to go. I've got small children. So helping them either choose where they go or design their own program at home with an understanding that if that program isn't successful, the next step is to consider a more structured residential program and building in what the contingencies could be. Um, certainly, we, we a lot of times are relying on folks on the phone who have been trusted advisors to families, physicians, other friends, whether it's in an intervention process, whether we're doing some kind of facilitated meeting, um, or whether we're trying to engage other folks in that person's support system to really come in and say, here are the boundaries we're going to set. We are gonna limit the financial distributions you are going to receive if you cannot comply with X, Y, Z. Um, we do a fair amount of intervention work. I will say that not all of it is as portrayed on the TV show on A&E, for those of you who have seen it. And I think it's a great example of certain types of intervention, but a lot of it is more gradual. A lot of situations we deal with, we're trying to get people to make small changes. We're trying to figure out where are the leverage points. You know, For younger folks, it's easier because there's usually some type of financial leverage. For older folks, we're often engaging adult children to try and see if they can set some boundaries with their parents. And then we deal with a lot of families who say, we eventually want to do a culmination of our concerns in one meeting. But for now, we kind of want to start with just smaller boundaries. And then the last tool we use is motivational interviewing, which is really getting clients to identify for themselves what their challenges have been and how that's impacted them negatively to help hopefully get them to own part of the solution. So with that, I would love Lisa to jump in and talk a little bit about how we use legal interventions with resistant clients. Thank you, Arden. That was that was wonderful. Thanks. You know, I should let everybody uh, who is in the audience know that if you want, you can actually swipe to show active speaker and you can move your screen so you don't have to see the slide. I've got only one slide uh, and it's I would rather that you really focus in uh, and and watch Arden and I uh, rather than watch this one slide because we have a lot of interesting things to say and I also know that some questions will come up so when those come up hold your questions if you will or put them into the chat box um, if you if you don't want to forget what it is we will make sure to get to your questions if you're really confused just let us know and uh, you know Put it right into the chat box and we'll stop and, and answer your questions um, but sometimes having that interaction will help to make it so that you'll understand better you know what's really interesting about covid uh, i am the mother of two children who are teenagers and i have realized with covid that this generation the generation of teenagers has seen swine flu H1N1, MERS, SARS, Lyme disease, Eastern equine encephalitis, 
and now COVID-19. So this generation was born into all kinds of threat outside their doors. Um, there, it's an interesting concept. You know, many of us are either baby boomers or we were born right after the boomers. And right now what we're looking at is a generation of Zoomers. And the Zoomers know disease. The only other time that in our generation, all of us, us and our children uh, and our parents, the only time that we have dealt with a daily death count is during the Vietnam War when Walter Cronkite would get on the 6 p.m. news and give the daily death rate. And then after 9-11, we also heard about a daily death rate and, and town by town, the people that had lost their lives. This is trauma. And the children and adults right now are dealing with trauma and crisis. People have been furloughed, people have been laid off. This has impacted people in many ways. They're watching market values change and it's been, it's been very difficult for people. When you have this kind of trauma, very often the courts will respond and the courts did respond. And so I want to jump right in to how the courts have responded. First of all, they're closed. All the courts in Massachusetts are closed, but I have been in court nonstop. I have been in court every single week, at least once. I, I am on trial tomorrow and Thursday, full day trials. It's been nonstop. There has been such an uptick because of the anxiety and the exacerbation to existing mental health issues that might have been low level before, but as Arden mentioned, a trauma like this, an issue like this, watching daily death rates and, and watching infection rates and knowing that outside your door, there is an infection or a major virus that we don't even understand, it's called novel, and it's inexplicable. And, and we count how many hours will it last, you know, in the air aerosolized and, and how many hours and days will it last on the cardboard box that comes to us from Amazon. This is fear inducing. And my team has seen an absolute uptick in mental health challenges um, in family situations and the family dynamics are hard, um, but the courts have been responsive. And so the courts will hear these emergencies. They'll hear emergency guardianships and emergency conservatorships. There've been challenges, but there've been some real advantages. So one challenge is when you go into court for a guardianship, which is the appointment of a person to make personal decisions for someone who lacks capacity, or when you go into court for a conservatorship, which is the appointment of a person to make financial decisions for a person who lacks capacity, you can't just go into court and ask for a guardianship based on your stories of, of disability and difficulty and challenge. You need clinical evidence. You need a medical certificate signed by an MD or a nurse practitioner, a psychiatric nurse practitioner, or somebody who has some licensure in Massachusetts and skill in this field of, of determining whether an individual lacks mental capacity to handle their personal affairs or their financial affairs. And because of COVID, it's been very difficult to bring a, a person before a clinician. People aren't meeting in person, but the courts understand this. And uh, the lawyers understand this, clinicians understand this. And so we've been handling this by having clinicians meet with their patients by Zoom enabled HIPAA compliant meetings, whether by telephone, whether with visual and video as well as audio. We were able to, my team, my, some of my team is on the line right now, but some of my team and I were able to actually get somebody evaluated in Florida and have him transported to Massachusetts accompanied by his cousin. And when he was in Florida, we had a Massachusetts clinician evaluate him with a HIPAA compliant Zoom. We got the papers for guardianship filed. 
He's now in Massachusetts. We managed that uh, with using his, his cousin and we're ready to go forward with the guardianship and everything is in place. Uh, I have another client right now where the court understands that she's going through a divorce. She has significant mental health issues, significant drug addiction issues, and the COVID was certainly no help, but exacerbated it. We are representing her parents as guardian and conservator to assist her through a divorce. And believe me, the COVID situation has exacerbated the difficulties in that marriage as well. So it's been, it's been a difficult situation, but the courts have understood. And they understand so well that uh, at one point I went into court and I was not able to get an updated medical certificate and the court understood. And based upon trust and reputation and experience between this judge and me and my having been in court in this particular matter before, and, and the judge remembering my client, the judge extended the guardianship and conservatorship without my having to get uh, clinicians involved for the second time around since the first order was just three months ago. It was 90 days ago. So we've been able to get some things reflexively extended um, and that has been a wonderful benefit. Another benefit that's making this process not only go faster, but also less expensively for my clients is that I used to drive to court and I would sit around the courthouse and, and I would wait for the case to get called and the court might have 60 cases in front of it that day. And I would hope and my client would hope that I'd be the first one called to the bench because that would be less expensive for my client than sitting and paying me to sit and wait for the case to be called. Well, now the court calls us. It calls either with a telephone or it's a Zoom instruction and we dial in by Zoom. And when we are identified for our case to be heard, we're right on the Zoom, we're right on the phone. And the whole hearing is 15 minutes from beginning to end, as opposed to the way it used to be where I would drive and it would take an hour to get there, an hour to get back. I'd be sitting in the courthouse a couple hours before you know it, I have billed my client five or seven hours for a 15 minute court appearance. I'm now billing my clients 15 minutes. And so the ultimate uh, expense is much less. However, it's more expensive on the administrative side. So we've got some fantastic paralegals in my firm and they have been struggling to get things filed because the courts are not open. They're physically not open. It used to be that the paralegals would go to court, they would meet with the gatekeepers, they would file the documents, they would speak with the clerks and explain the emergency. They would explain factual details. They were able to manage aspects of practicing law as paralegals in the most strategic way, in a way that you just can't repeat. And now it's actually hard for us to get filed. Documents get rejected by accident because the computer program isn't working right on the court side. There are delays administratively. But in terms of the legal time, it is much faster and much more streamlined. So that's been good. The court, I think reputation really matters here. When you've got a reputation in this area of law, then the judges will recognize who you are and they're more inclined to give you the relief that you want because they've got years of trust. You know, I have a history here. I've been practicing law for a good long time. Uh, and I used to represent the Department of Mental Health and before that, the Department of Mental Retardation, which is now known as the uh, as DDS uh, and the Disabled Person Protection Commission. So when I walk into court or when I zoom into court nowadays, I'm known. And therefore, the business of practicing law is easier now with a Zoom-enabled or telephonic hearing. And that's been going well. Um, but let me talk now not just about how it's going in court when you get there, but also how to avoid it, how to avoid court in the first place, and what kind of legal tools you can put in place for your family. There's a lot of tools out there. And when I listen to a client, my goal is to find whatever is the most simple, 
streamlined tool to get the client's needs met. And by client, I usually mean the family, the family uh, that has somebody, a family member who has a mental illness or an addiction issue, but I'm generally representing the family of that family member. One way to deal with this is with a healthcare proxy. That's a document that can be signed by the person who is struggling with a challenging mental illness, but it can be signed when they're competent to sign it. And it can include HIPAA language, which will allow their nominated, designated agent to make healthcare decisions for them. And it will allow that person to speak with clinicians for them if at some point in the future, they're incapacitated and not able to speak on their own behalf, or if they're not doing well because of challenging mental health and behavioral health issues. Um, healthcare proxy language can include what's called living will language. So it, it can include information about not only what kinds of treatments you would want to consent to or refuse, but also what if you are in intractable pain with a low quality of life, or perhaps you're frail and elderly, or you have some kind of a pre-existing terminal illness and you can't reasonably expect it to go back to any quality of, of life at all, then having this living will language is a good thing to have in there um, as just one feature of your healthcare proxy. On the other side, so that's all health related. On the other side are durable powers of attorney. These are powers of attorney because they're durable. They last through your incapacity. And if you've got somebody in your family who is suffering and, and not able to handle their assets and you need to protect their assets or you need to help them with decision making, you might have them sign a durable power of attorney. What I recommend is that I do the drafting, I would represent you, but we'll get some other attorney to meet independently with with your family members so that that person's independently represented. And healthcare proxies, durable powers of attorney can be revoked by the person who signs it. But what I'll do is sometimes put in language in these documents that include a cooling down period. So that an individual who might be at the moment in a challenging emotional state can't just revoke the documents at a time when they most need them. There'll be a cooling down period that they themselves have agreed to at a time when they've had the mental capacity to make this knowing and voluntary choice. And with this cooling down period, they need to revoke twice. How long is a cooling down period? It depends on the circumstances of the case. I've had some of them be 24 hours, and then you do a second revocation and that revokes the document. I've had them be 72 hours, three days, or two weeks, whatever it is. But it's, a, it's something that requires dialogue between the family and the family member who's feeling the challenging mental health concerns. There are a group of people who are uh, in that age 18 to age 35 range where sometimes mental illness issues are emerging. Uh, it's that young adult stage, uh, or sometimes there's difficulty launching into the world, or you get a situation like COVID that creates an exacerbation of an issue that was never that bad before, but now it is. Well, you can include language in your durable power of attorney, not only HIPAA language that'll enable your decision maker your surrogate to speak with clinicians, but you can also have FERPA language, which is uh, related to educational information. So, you know, you might have a situation where there's a young adult trying to get through college, but is struggling, uh, maybe because of addiction or mental illness or an eating disorder, some issue like this, and is failing, but actually really should have an incomplete rather than a fail on their transcript. So what I've done in situations like this is I've included FERPA language so that the designated agent can uh, work with the school, get information, and assist in, in correcting a transcript so that what looks like a fail now will report as a medical incomplete or a withdrawal. And you can save a person's career really by starting 
uh, right there in the college days, making sure that the launch is going to be better than it otherwise would be if a launch is interrupted and impacted by mental illness and addiction. So these are good things you can include in your documents. There's a document that uh, relates to children. If you've got minor children, you might want to sign a guardianship proxy. An emergency guardianship proxy is a document that parents can sign that nominates a guardian in the event that the parents are temp uh, temporarily incapacitated. You know, this, this happens. We should, we should all have these documents as part of our plan. Hopefully we'll never need them. These are, these are tip, they deal with typical life situations. There's nothing extraordinary about this. People sometimes, we should all have these documents, even if we don't have mental illness in the family. We should all have healthcare proxies, durable powers, and emergency guardianship proxies that relate to our children so that if we have a temporary period of incapacity, somebody can take care of the children and somebody can act as guardian. It shortcuts, it's a shortcut. It short circuits it so you don't have to go to court. It's done all by document and it lasts 60 days. And usually that's enough. Certainly in a COVID situation, 60 days is really all you need. You don't need to go to court and get a larger, a longer guardianship. There are other ways that you can, other tools that you can use, other ways that you can intervene strategically to assist the family member to leverage behavioral change uh, if a person is struggling. So I've used incentive trusts where I will discuss with the family member what behavioral problems have come up socially and emotionally and, and what's happening for an individual, for a family member, and what kind of incentives can be put in place to prevent it from creating havoc and a longer term ramification against the interest of the person who is potentially incapacitated or looking at some kind of mental incapacity. An incentive trust will provide a reward or, or even impose a consequence, but usually provide awards, a, a reward, sometimes a financial reward for meeting a milestone. The milestone might be attending psychiatry once a month. So you go to your psychiatrist's office once a month, you get your injectable, you get a distribution from the trust. It's, it can be that simple. Or, you, or if there's um, addiction, you show up for your five panel or seven panel talk screen, you get a distribution from the trust. It could be that simple. But I've put some really interesting ones in place. I had uh, a, a young adult who needed to stop using drugs and, and be home at a certain time. And his parents got together with the grandparents and we developed a beautiful incentive contract it wasn't even a trust it was a contract where he would be earning gym equipment to uh, to create his a basement gym and he created a beautiful gym based on incentives and rewards that he received for meeting his curfew coming home clean and sober and just being home by 10 p.m every night and that was one way that the family managed an issue that could have otherwise uh, turned into criminal involvement uh, in the criminal justice system. I've used probation orders successfully where I have discussed with the assistant attorney general that an individual should not face criminal sentencing because the underlying issue is not a criminal one. It's one that relates to mental health issues. And in that situation, I will call the assistant district attorney and talk about what kind of clinical recommendations I'm receiving from, let's say, Arden's team. And I'll then take those clinical recommendations and I will work with the assistant district attorney and exert my influence as a lawyer and as a persuader in order to uh, to divert the criminal law process away from criminal law sentencing and instead put together a probation order that looks like a treatment plan. And so I can bring together the clinical, bring together the legal, 
and use some influence here to have, let's say, a memorandum of understanding with the individual and the family, probation orders with the criminal justice system and with the court and other documents in place so that we have a nice wraparound approach to dealing with very difficult issues that can be mishandled if they're not appropriately handled. Uh, during the COVID crisis and at all times, I've been able to get people into a psychiatric hospital when needed. I've been able to, and, and Arden and I sometimes work together on this, to get somebody into a psychiatric hospital if there's an emergency or an individual is a danger to themselves or others. We work with clinicians to make this happen. We can get people out of the hospital. There are strategies that relate to whether or not we want to turn an emergency involuntary hospitalization into a voluntary conditional hospitalization and ultimately uh, try to foster some buy-in and investment in treatment for four days, 10 days, maybe a medication change, and then we can try to pull the individual out of the psychiatric hospital with the willingness of clinicians, with a treatment plan in place, with the family on board, and with a nice cushion underground, which might include a guardianship and a conservatorship as well. We can also transfer people escorted from one psychiatric hospital to a, a nicer, more elegant or more posh psychiatric hospital or treatment program or a long-term recovery program. You know, Arden and I uh, constantly deal with individuals, individual family members who are in what feels like a revolving door. They, they relapse, they get treatment, they recover, and the recovery is not long enough, it's not intense enough, it's not wrap around enough, it's not encompassing enough, and it ends too soon. And as soon as it feels too controlling to the individual, that individual might stop it completely, whereas it might be the time to scale back gently. And there's a finesse to that. There's an elegant finesse to the scaling back of legal clinical support that will promote recovery in a longer term way. And so using a team uh, like the team that we can provide, we can gauge when to start scaling back and how to scale back. We might end the guardianship, but keep the pleadings on file. I've had clients say to me, just keep the pleadings there. We don't want to dismiss it yet. We want that cushion. We want to just know it's there because the mere fact that you're on file at court is enough to free the individual enough to focus on recovery. You know, you might think, it's, it's kind of counterintuitive, you might think that having guardianship pleadings on file has a, a, a forced impact. But if there's no guardianship in place, it's simply a cushion. It's just a freeing cushion. And then the family and the individual can work together on a longer term recovery plan that might include placement in a long term recovery type of a uh, location that might be very relaxing, that certainly is uh, elegant and that feels good uh, and, and doesn't feel like what we think of as a state hospital type of a situation that's undignified. We have some very dignified placements. We can arrange for a very dignified transport and escort. Um, we, we both provide very concierge level services. And along those lines, um, I provide trustee services. So I've been working through the COVID uh, shelter to make sure that our clients' needs are met. Uh, we sometimes have a client who feels that the outside world is very threatening to them. We can bring in psychiatry. We can bring in personal and private investigators we can help a person to make sure that their home is safe. We can bring in security systems. Uh, we can bring in food. We can bring in clinicians. Uh, a client can let me know what type of clinician they need and I would turn to Arden and we would strategize about this and bring in the right clinician, not just any clinician. Um, 
And we've got a lot of people who in shelter are struggling because as Arden mentioned, families are feeling stuck together. Uh, and sometimes that's leading to separations and divorce and parenting plan problems. So sometimes parents who might have potentially had relationship that was on the rocks already might be thinking, this is it. I, I am sheltered together with this person. I'm stuck and I need to get divorced. Uh, or they need to figure out who's got the children when. There's a lot of parents who are already divorced uh, and who have been for some time, who've been shuffling the children back and forth between two parents. And COVID made that very difficult, uh, especially for parents who are first responders or who are working in hospitals and who are clinicians themselves and who have children. It's been very difficult to figure out who's going to quarantine and how and where and how you bring food into a quarantine situation, how you bring clinical supports into a quarantine situation, uh, and, and how safe is that quarantine? How, how real is the quarantine? Or, or is it just a sham quarantine? But one of the issues is, how do we deal with the children? How do we get the children to see both parents during quarantine? So uh, I've been working with my clients to help that happen in the best possible way because the anxiety just changes the situation completely. Arden, do you want to add anything before I go any further? No, I think this has been really helpful information. It's, it's just fascinating to me that you've been able to function. I don't want to say as though COVID is not present, but that you've still been able to provide this really important service to families who are really struggling. And, and like we said, I think what we saw as a trend, and I'm, I'm hearing the same from others, is when COVID first happened, everyone sort of froze, but kind of presumed things would go back to some semblance of what it was before within a, a period of time. So people weren't necessarily intervening all that much with loved ones for the beginning through the end of March. I think now we're in a time period where families are assuming we could be under some restrictions for some form for a lot longer. And if folks have a mental health addiction, eating disorder, special need, um, that they're not gonna be able to postpone for another six to 18 months or whenever we get a vaccine and wait to get that help, that they're gonna have to figure out a solution. So it's great to hear that you've been able to figure it out and that your reputation, your well-deserved reputation has served you well. Um, Thank you. I know we're getting up against the end of time. I want to give you, do you have other things you want to add or do we want to try and, I don't see any questions on the chat, but I'm not sure if any, any are out there, but I want to make sure we address any from our audience as well. We're happy to take questions. Go right ahead. If there's any questions, go right ahead and ask them. Unmute yourself to ask or put them up in the chat screen and we'll answer. I don't see any. I don't either. That's good. That's a good sign. That means we've been explaining ourselves pretty well. We answered all the questions. Yeah. Um, for those of you who are listening, we absolutely are happy to provide slides and a recording if you'd like. Um, any parting words that you want to bring up, Lisa, to sort of wrap things up? And then certainly, again, if there's a question, feel free to chat it in. Sure, sure. So I, I agree with you that this is not just, COVID was not just a pause. It wasn't just a hiatus. I think when we all went into shelter, we thought it was a pause. Uh, and what we're seeing is that this is a long term change in the way that we do the things that we've always done. Uh, the entire market has shifted. Uh, people are handling clinical needs differently. They're handling legal needs differently. Even uh, the economy that we knew has changed. People are getting food delivered by delivery companies. They're using Amazon like mad. Initially, Amazon took three weeks to bring, you know, dishwasher detergent, and now you get it same day or within 24 hours. So Amazon figured it out. Um, so everything has changed. The economy has shifted and the needs are being filled and that this has also happened with law and it's happened in clinical practice everything changed and it's not going to go back to what we thought it would go back to when we went into shelter we thought that everything would just 
snap back when the surge was done, like as if it were a tornado ripping through Massachusetts, but then heading out to Kansas. Well, it's not that way. You know, unfortunately, as I mentioned initially, this generation, the Zoomer generation, the, the boomers to the Zoomers are seeing, you know, infection after infection and threats that are health related right outside of our door. And COVID is not going away. It's a coronavirus. There's a million coronaviruses out there. This one is unusual. This one's new. And there's no vaccine yet. There's no treatment yet. And it's, it's around, it, it hasn't left. It's not any um, less lethal or dangerous than it was. It's simply less prevalent because less people have it. And so we all need to continue to stay safe. Uh, we need to re-enter the world safely and in a new way. We're gonna continue to see infection. We're gonna continue to see a couple of spikes and it's going to continue to cause anxiety in, in life and it's going to continue to exacerbate mental health issues. So the issues that we're talking about are now into the future. There's a long runway on it. Uh, and for those who are watching, if you have any need to reach us, you can. The last slide that we will show you has our, our email address and our information. There's a typo on mine that relates to spell check. So El Kukie in spell check world is, is luckier. So it says, it, it, it changes it to luckier. So there's a little bit of a typo, but it should be L-C-U-K-I-E-R for Lisa Kukier. Um, and if you need us, you know how to reach us. You also have the emails, just let us know. We're happy to help. Arden, back to you. Sure, so I just wanted to answer. It looks like we do have one question. And of course, as I'm trying to do this, I'm typing your incorrect email address. This, there we go. Um, so one of the questions came in, what types of clients do each of you work with? What kind, i.e., what kind of resources do families need? We use our services. So I'll do a quick elevator pitch for mine, which is we deal with addiction, mental health, eating disorders, and autism. So clients come to us because they need a plan for what to do with a family member. They're not sure what the diagnosis is or they're not sure how to address an issue. They have a resistant family member and they need some type of interventional support. They want to elongate the gains that someone has made while in residential treatment. So they want a coach to come in the home, either on a live-in basis or on a few hours a week to support with daily living skills, managing behaviors, um, getting a job, going to self-help meetings, almost like what you would see for a geriatric client only with a behavioral health focus. And clients also use us for general coaching. We get hired by employers to manage crisis situations. So crisis management is another area. And we work all over the country with young children and much older adults. So I did it quickly because we're coming to the end. Lisa, did you want to add what, what kind of clients do you work with and what do they come to? Sure. Sure, sure. So I handle uh, mental health issues and divorce issues and trust litigation. So it might be divorce and custody issues, or it might be mental health law issues that implicate guardianship and conservatorship, or elder financial exploitation, will contests after family members have died, trust con contests and trust litigation. I do some estate planning, but the planning that I do is the strategy work for blended families. Um, we have estate planners, Cracker Jack estate planners in my firm. Uh, and so when there are modern families, blended families, there might be multi-generational marriages and the need for prenuptial agreements, the need for different kinds of trusts, or there might be adopted children and step families and adult children from a prior relationship and subsequent spouses. So these kinds of situations create family challenges that have nothing to do with mental illness. And so any family type issues, family challenges and joys, I handle adoptions and, and put people's estate plans into good positioning. And so there's some joys too. It's not all difficult content, but when there is difficult family situations from divorce to mental health law, and clients don't have to have a lot of money. You don't have to be multimillionaires to, to use our services. We have a team where our firm has 130 lawyers or so, and we have a team of about 
30 that handle family law issues and mental health law issues at different billing rates. And so we're able to bring a suburban level price structure with a, a city sophistication to your family law needs. And we're a very resourced firm. So if you have needs, just reach out. Well, I wanna thank everybody on the line today for participating. We are happy to again send the slides and any information. Um, please don't hesitate to reach out if we can be helpful. Thank you, Lisa, for co-hosting this with me. It was really enjoyable. And thank you, Sydney, for arranging the logistics. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone.